Welcome to this extraordinary group of individuals on our panel to discuss an extremely important subject, uh, how to manage the next financial crisis. And I'm actually going to modify that and include how to manage the next recession. So you won't be able to get away with saying there isn't going to be a financial crisis for a while. Um, it seems to me that there is growing concern around the world about the possibility of a global economic slowdown and uh, concern about how that will be managed next time around. Uh, the global expansion is pretty mature. The US is in the 11th year of an expansion. It's now the longest on record. And we are seeing signs of slowing in many parts of the world, and we are seeing signs of confidence waning, particularly because of concerns about the trade war. And at the same time, by traditional standards, we're relatively low on ammunition. Policy rates in the world's big uh, mature economy central banks are close to zero, and deficit and debt levels are pretty high. So I think the question is, how big is the risk and when the next recession comes, and I suspect it's somewhat uncontroversial to say when it comes, when it comes, how will we deal with it? Um, to discuss this, uh, an extraordinary panel um, of existing and former practitioners. Most of you were closely involved with the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. Um, so I'm going to jump straight in. Uh, David Solomon, you said recently that you thought there was a 25% chance of a U.S. recession within the next year. Assuming you're right, does the U.S. have the tools to cope with the next recession? Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And I did say that a few weeks ago. Um, and it's interesting the way the question's framed. I actually was saying that in the context of the fact that I think the chances of a recession in the next year in the U.S. are low. And I thought 25% was actually, was actually a smaller probability in the distribution. And <laughs> interestingly, interestingly, just in the last 24 hours, our U.S. economist, Jan Hatzius, came out and talked about the fact with the potential for trade tensions to ease and the fact that there has been continuing monetary policy support or easing conditions that their view of the U.S. trajectory over the 12 months is a little bit more positive and they actually see growth accelerating a little bit from where it's been. But to your question specifically, central bankers have a variety of tools and depending on when a slowdown comes, what's the form of that slowdown, uh, it'll, it'll have an impact on which tools can be used and which tools can't. At the moment in the U.S., there's more room with monetary policy than, say, there would be in Europe, although you're fair to point out not to the same degree that you might have seen if you look historically over six, eight, ten cycles. Uh, obviously, with fiscal policy, given deficits, et cetera, it's more complicated. So I have a, a great belief in the resiliency of the system and the ability for, in a slowdown, which I think would be the most likely scenario, uh, central bankers to manage that, but I, you know, I think it's a good thing to think about, and you're framing a reasonable question. So I can, I can summarize that by saying you think that U.S. policymakers do have enough tools to cope? I, you know, if, if, if what we have is a slowdown, and a, re a regular, ordinary recession, sure, to the degree that something else happened and we found ourselves in a more complex situation, uh, they, they still have tools, but they might have to look, they might have to look at a more aggressive way to combat some of what you're dealing with. But these are, these are broad questions, and it's hard to be specific when you really don't know what the facts are that you'll face at that time. Thank you. Governor Joe, I'm going to turn to you now, because in 2008, 2009, China obviously played a huge role in supporting the global economy with a very dramatic uh, expansionary response. Does China have the tools to um, cope this time? to a global financial crisis or indeed a global recession? And if so, how will it do so? Uh, yeah, it's a, a very good question. <laughs> uh, uh, let me uh, have a little bit of review of uh, uh, 2008, 2009 crisis period. Uh, the first is uh, for dealing with uh, the potential next uh, crisis. Uh, we'd better to prevent the crisis to happen. So uh, one of the uh, serious uh, uh, lesson is that uh, how uh, do we prevent the bubble to grow up? Uh, so uh, more than 10 years ago, it was uh, subprime uh, bubbles happened. So this time we needed to, to prevent that. Uh, the second, uh, I think, is uh, if you got into zero lower bound of uh, monetary policy, uh, it's become difficult for central bank to play a positive role. Uh, 
Uh, and now we are in a relatively very low interest rate period, uh, low inflation period. Uh, it's, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, we need to try our best to avoid to get into zero lower bound uh, before the crisis happened. Uh, so uh, we still have our room to do that. For China now, uh, yeah, we, uh, our interest rates uh, is not uh, uh, as low as uh, in many advanced countries. Now, the prime rate is uh, a little bit over uh, 4% uh, for one year. Uh, so we still have uh, a room to deal with uh, the monetary policy expansion. However, whether monetary policy expansion can successfully deal with the crisis or not, uh, it's also dependent on the cooperation with fiscal policy and uh, whether we have uh, uh, structural uh, reform policies to, to do the, uh, together. Uh, the, the third one, I think, uh, for the IMF to play a, a, a good role. Uh, in 2009, IMF actually mobilize uh, yeah, several hundred billion U.S. dollars, uh, so-called financial resource, uh, to support those uh, of a country uh, who got uh, the negative impact from uh, a global financial crisis. Um, later on, in 2012, uh, in the uh, uh, G20 Mexico uh, session, that's the last car was, uh, there's another round of increase MF results. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, for the new round of crisis, the IMF can still play uh, that, that kind of role. Uh, so it's uh, still a room. Finally, I say that's the liquidity. Uh, in the uh, financial crisis period, uh, U.S. Fed inject uh, liquidity to have uh, a currency swap uh, with uh, uh, ECB, with uh, Bank of England, uh, uh, Swiss uh, National Bank, and the Bank of Japan. Uh, but for many emerging markets, that liquidity uh, could not reach them. So China actually uh, initiate the, the local currency swap with uh, South Korea, with Malaysia, and later on uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Argentina, Brazil. I think that kind of thing is also available uh, for, uh, for uh, alleviate uh, the pain of uh, global financial crisis. That's a very important point, and we'll come back to it, whether the nature of international cooperation is different. Tijan, before we do that, I wanted to turn to you to give the perspective from Europe. China has policy rates at 4%, and many, in the euro area, they're basically you know, negative. Um, does Europe, how does the euro area cope with an extra session? Can it cope with an extra session? Well, thank you, Zanin. It's going to be a very uh, challenging uh, period for sure, because if you, if you look at what's going on, uh, first of all, there's very little fiscal room, eh, because we're already running in Europe significant fiscal deficit, so there's very, very little uh, fiscal flexibility. Interest rates are negative, so there's very little room to go lower. And if you look at the, the pressure points, certainly uh, physical asset prices have increased enormously across the board because of, of the search for yield and revenue. I mean, when you have negative interest rates, you automatically uh, have uh, um, cash yielding assets uh, that people want. I mean, so real estate, to be clear, uh, becomes very attractive. If you're corporate and you leave your we started charging negative rates in Switzerland, above 2 million. So if you leave your money in a bank account, you get less every day. So of course, the money is looking for physical assets, uh, income producing real estate, etc. Has, has been a, a big pressure. So, and then you have the German question. Um, Germany has been suffering of two things. One is the, the reduction in global trade, because it's, a, it's an export machine. So it's been impacted by that. And two, the automobile sector, the fact that it's very much an automotive driven economy and they need to move from the, the bed they made on diesel to electricity and that's going to be also very challenging. And just a word on France because uh, um, it's France and Germany that are going to be the battlegrounds. Uh, I'm more confident in the ability of Germany to make that transition than in the ability of France to conduct the structural reforms that we know are necessary in the labor market in particular and in the pension, in the pension sector. So uh, tough picture. Um, 
potential bright spot right, if somebody manages to, to get uh, Germany to consume more. I mean, that's, where all, that's where everybody's looking, but I think that's a, it's been on the table for a long time and it just hasn't happened. So that's very gloomy. So there's no fiscal policy room, no monetary policy room, and you're relying on exports. Um, okay, that's the European I, view. That, that we, we will, we'll come back to that in a second. You, you uh, ask me, I answer. No, no, no I think, I'm sure you're right, but it's very sobering. Senior Minister Tarman, um, you, you have played a key role throughout this period. Uh, you've also spoken a lot about and been a participant in international cooperation. I'm struck by two things. Um, firstly, if there were uh, a financial crisis of the scale of 2008, do we have the political will to have international cooperation of the sort that you had in the G20 before? And secondly, to, to go back to Governor Joe's point, is there, in fact, perhaps more room for, for China to lead an international cooperative response than the traditional Bretton Woods institutions? Well, I think the problems of the next downturn, be they financial or be they of some other variety of recession, can only be tackled this time round if we also tackle the problems of a longer term nature. And the central problem is managing the strategic rivalry between the United States and China with technological rivalry and the possibility of bifurcated supply chains being the most important dimension of that. If we don't solve that problem, it's going to be very hard to solve the underlying economic problems that make this cycle in danger of a downturn. And the real issue is not the next downturn, it's the underlying factors. Why is private investment so weak? Why is there so much uncertainty in the air? Why is innovation slowed down? Why is productivity growth so slow, less than half of what it was before the crisis? Why is TFP growth, what the economists call total factor productivity growth, running at 0% in both the mature economies and the emerging economies? Those are problems of a fundamental underlying nature. They're supply side problems. But if we, go, if we end up in a world of bifurcated technologies, standards, and supply chains, it's a world of less innovation, less dynamism, and it's a world where we can't tackle this fundamental underlying problem. But, but we, I'm sure we can't tackle the underlying problem, but what about the short-term problem of how to cope with a downturn? Do you think the capacity is there to work together as countries did in 2008, 2009, or are we in a very different world? So I, I think uh, it's a very good question, and I think the... the the problem is wrongly posed most of the time. The problem was first dominated by thinking about monetary policy. And I think we all accept that monetary policy has severely diminishing returns. It already has. And in the next downturn, even if there is space for interest rate cuts to a limited extent or more QE, it has severely diminishing returns. So the attention now focuses on fiscal policy. But what I'm saying is that we have to think about it not in terms of the traditional game of can you run a larger fiscal deficit or your, can your debt-to-GDP ratio go a little higher. We have to think of it in terms of the fundamental problem. Why is private investment so weak globally? US, India, Europe, Japan, everywhere. Why is it weak in China? That's the heart of the problem. So when we think about fiscal policy, we have to think about how you use fiscal policy, be they the microeconomic measures like tax incentives and subsidies of various forms, or investment in public goods. How do you use fiscal policy to spur private investment? Because if you don't spur private investment, you're not going to be able to tackle the underlying <coughs> problem of productivity growth. That's a very good point, and I'm going to hope to come back to that too. I think I'm notching up two reasonably optimistic people and two quite pessimistic people thus far. So, so Luis, um, where do you stand on this? And in particular, give us the sense of um, the Latin American perspective. Do you think Latin American countries are more or less vulnerable than they were 10 years ago? Well, they're certainly more vulnerable today than they were before. They, were, they had better uh, fiscal balances at the time. Uh, they had basically were running current account surpluses for the most part, especially the larger economies. That's no longer the case. And certainly 
those set of buffers that existed do not exist today. So certainly Latin American economies will be looking at this from a perspective uh, of much more vulnerability. In fact, what you have today, if you just observe Latin American growth in general, the combination of the two large economies, both Mexico and Brazil, almost at flat growth today, uh, combined with a big recession already taking place in Venezuela and a contraction in Argentina that has brought down significantly overall growth in Latin America. So you are really in a moment of, of very low growth by comparison uh, to other emerging markets. Coupled with the fact of many of the things that have been mentioned here, you know, productivity has consistently been low. It's even lower today. Uh, you equally have a, a problem of flows, and certainly the minute that we have a, a monetary consolidation, that immediately will help bring a lot of capital outflows, and that has a, an effect on currencies. So these are some of the challenges that we see in Latin America, and certainly going to Governor Joy's point, uh, I think what you need essentially to be ready for something like this is a stronger IMF to be able to support, especially those countries that are not going to get the kind of support uh, of the larger economies, uh, regardless of where they're at. I think that puts you in the, in the sober camp. Yes. Um, Governor Joe, I now want to turn to, having got a sense of, of where you all are in terms of the risks, talk me through what you think of where the next recession will take central banking. There's a lot of talk about unconventional responses, helicopter money. A senior minister, Tarman, talked about fiscal policy in a long-term setting. You know, you are a veteran central banker. Do you think central banking will be changing dramatically in the light of the next recession? Uh, it's, uh, I think, a more difficult uh, question to me. Uh, because China uh, has been not yet uh, got uh, zero lower bond. So, uh, personally, I haven't yet seriously studied of those of unconventional monetary policy, especially uh, modern monetary theory or MP3. Uh, but actually, uh, I think that uh, uh, we can still... Uh, try to avoid to getting uh, very soon into the negative interest rate uh, area. Uh, if we could successfully manage uh, uh, that uh, the macroeconomic control uh, in this regard, then we don't need to uh, consider that much of uh, unconventional monetary policy. Uh, in my understanding, that's. Uh, QE is uh, actually it's one of the traditional, uh, it's a conventional monetary policy. It's not unconventional. Both the price and the quantity is conventional tools. But unconventional is that uh, whether uh, the money uh, injections uh, could directly help to reach the fiscal deficit and to support the fiscal expenditure. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, very unconventional. Uh, and uh, in my mind, uh, uh, we need to have a further uh, study of uh, inflation. The inflation has, has been used uh, by so many years uh, uh, in terms of uh, the price uh, index of uh, goods and service. But now I think that uh, the purchasing power move more and more uh, to the side of uh, health care, the whether the pension could uh, uh, to gain the reasonable return or not. So actually, uh, if we use the new concept and the new statistic package of inflation, uh, that uh, uh, we may have a different picture to understand better of uh, monetary policy. Thank you. Senior Minister Tarman, what about your view? Is what you were describing earlier about l linking short-term to long-term fiscal policy essentially what, what people mean when they're talking about helicopter money, but rather than helicopter money for a tax cut, helicopter money for funding infrastructure spending? Well, I think uh, be it helicopter money or modern monetary theory is more uh, a vision of thinking of the long term as a constant short term. Uh, and that's fundamentally, I think, wrong. Uh, the solution to the problems we face today are not about more money, be it fiscal injections or monetary injections. Uh, 
It's about confidence and it's about innovation. And I think by any measure in both the mature economies and the developing economies, there's huge scope for investment that's still untapped. First, making the climate transition, which is going to require very large investments, very large public investments and private investments. And we're already late. Second, reinvesting in infrastructure in the mature economies, particularly digital infrastructures and avoiding a di digital divide. Third, if you have to think about the developing world, which is where two-thirds or three-quarters of the world's growth now comes from, of which only a quarter is from China and the rest is from the rest of the emerging world, we've got to ensure that the emerging world gets the investment it needs. Otherwise, the world goes through a weaker phase of growth. And it means it using fiscal policy to provide public guarantees and to mitigate risks so that we can unleash a wave of private investment. Those are the big priorities. Climate change, reinvesting in infrastructure and the digital infrastructures of the future. And thirdly, ensuring that the emerging world, with Africa being foremost, but the emerging world as a whole, gets the investment flows it needs. If we don't solve that problem, the world has something coming. So, David, you hear that. Uh, what are the odds of the U.S. government responding to a downturn with a major infrastructure program or, indeed, a major climate addressing program uh, or, indeed, a major program of, uh, of guaranteeing loans to the emerging world? Well, I, 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 again, you're framing. We, we, we move from a very narrow question about whether or not monetary policy, whether or not the U.S. had tools in a recession to manage in a recession, and now we're talking about some of the big, significant issues that are important for all of us to participate in sustained growth in the world across developed economies and developing economies. I, you know, I, I agree with the senior minister, the discussion of climate transition, but just sustainability broadly, which obviously includes climate, it also includes creating an economic system that brings people along and more people participate, the investment that's gonna be necessary across both developing and developed economies is significant. When you ask the question in the context of a middle recession, is the U.S. going to be thinking about that? If it's a bad recession, no. But that's a short-term reaction. It's not a long-term policy initiative. And I think one of our jobs as capital allocators is to try to be in a position to help those with capital direct that capital in the medium and long term to these things that ultimately provide more sustainable growth for everyone. But I guess the, the, the interesting question is whether, given that we are relatively low on traditional short-term policy tools, and there are these large long-term needs that Senior Minister talked about, whether in the advanced world, and I'm going to turn it both to you and to Jijian, whether the political environment can change such that these long-term fiscal investments are thought about more positively. And, and Jijian, why don't I turn it to you? Because Europe has, is extraordinary. The negative interest rates are negative, and yet there is no willingness to do long-term fiscal infrastructure investment. Well, you, you, you've described me as, as pessimistic. I, I, I would add pessimistic on the Eurozone. It's actually, on a, on a global uh, s scale, I'm much more positive. I'm very much with Taman and Prime Minister Taman because I, I really see the emerging economies. All we do at Credit Suisse, I've described our strategy as being the bank for entrepreneurs. We see those entrepreneurs everywhere from Brazil to, to the Middle East, to, and they're extraordinary. The number of unicorns, I was just in Brazil two weeks ago, is amazing, and, and that is... Uh, unstoppable and it makes me very optimistic and very positive about the direction the, the world is taking. I, I think that the, the pressures are on the developed mature economies where it's a cocktail of demography um, which is negative with the aging of the population and unaffordable welfare promises. Yeah. That's really the toxic uh, combination and everybody kind of knows it and at some point uh, somebody must say the emperor has no clothes and then there has to be a some kind of political uh, agreement or reassessment. Uh, I am personally, I believe it's going to happen. I just think it's a very painful process. Uh, if we look at your country right now, it looks like it's going in the opposite direction because instead of fiscal discipline, everybody's promising, uh, uh, you know, m m even less discipline. My more, country is not a country spending. to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I, but I think I think that ultimately. 
Uh, I believe in democracy. I think democracy functions. Sometimes it functions too slowly. And it takes time to, to get to the point where people actually finally do the right thing. Uh, and I think Churchill who said you can always count on the U.S. to do the right thing, but only having, after having exhausted all the other options. But it's a, it's a bit the same for, uh, for democracies. I believe Europe will do the right thing ultimately, but it's going to be a painful process and a relatively slow process. Luis, we're going to have to draw to a close soon, but I wanted to ask one last question to you, which is do you think the U.S. dollar-denominated dominance of the global financial system will remain unchanged at the end of the next recession or downturn? Oh, I, I definitely think so, especially, you know, looking at many of the emerging economies, you will see that. I mean, there's been, of course, a lot of efforts. You know, Governor Joe did a, a lot, he, what he was mentioning in terms of internationalizing, internationalizing the renminbi. Uh, there will be other options, but I think, I, I, I think in the final analysis still will be uh, the, the dollar uh, that will okay. dominate. So we now have about three and a half minutes left, and I want to ask each of you in 30 seconds or so to give us one, um, what, what do you think will be the biggest surprise of the next downturn or the biggest thing to, to worry about? Um, just to leave the audience with one concrete thing, because often downturns surprise us, so we're going to give people a sense of being ahead of the game here. Governor Joe, what do you think will be the biggest uh, surprise of the next downturn? Uh, uh, actually, I, I think uh, it should be not a surprise. That's, uh, uh, I worry two things. One is uh, the, the bubble I already mentioned. Another is uh, the trade friction or trade wall. Actually, that's a trade wall in history could blow global economic uh, down. Uh, it's, uh, we need to seriously facing that kind of possibility. Thank you. Tijan. I think you'll see higher default rates than in previous cycles because the low or negative interest rates have had two consequences. People have borrowed too much and two, a lot of companies that should not be around are around because they've been maintained artificially alive. So all our statistics on default rates, etc., I think will prove wrong which means you have to have a very strong balance sheet if you're, if you're in a financial institution because there will be a lot of, um, a lot of casualties. On the positive side, the banking sector is much stronger. If you think about gone concern capital, it's at 1.6 trillion globally. It was zero before the previous crisis. All of TARP cost 250 billion. So uh, our balance sheets are stronger and I think we'll cope, but you can expect more, uh, more casualties, more disruption than in previous cycles. Thank you. Dave Solomon. Um, Liquidity in markets, it's, it's, been, it's been 10 years since the financial crisis. Uh, there's been lots of change in market structure, and there's a, people have a perception of liquidity that's available under stress because there's something going on, whether it's a recession or there's something going on under real stress. I think there'll be more discussion about what kind of liquidity is available in markets, and when you own, uh, you know, when you own assets, you know, are the expectations set right with respect to liquidity? Thank you. Senior Minister Tarwin. Well, I think that... Uh, three uh, unknowns, and I would actually say they are known unknowns. The first is how uh, this strategic rivalry between the US and China evolves. Do you end up in a bifurcated world, or do you end up with some sort of competitive coexistence? Uh, the second is the Middle East, uh, because that's always where you get the potential for a spark, and the tinder is dry. But the third, very importantly, in any downturn, wherever it comes from, is whether the politics of the day responds to the social anxieties and the uh, despondency on the ground by consolidating things in the middle or whether we get further polarization. Uh, these are three unknowns, but they're not unknowns that are beyond uh, agency. They're not beyond our own ability to shape the future. And I think we, our responsibility is to shape that future, to go for competitive coexistence between the US and China, to be able to manage a very difficult situation in the Middle East without things sparking out of control, and thirdly, to get some semblance of a strengthening of the middle and the center in politics. That's a tall order. Luis, your last word. The, the, to me, one of the big challenges is for governments under this environment, to continue to do the kinds of structural reforms that are needed to be ahead of the curve. 
And of course, if you have a recession and or a financial crisis, what does all that mean in terms of people's views and society's views in terms of globalization and or capitalism? And I think underlying that, of course, are the issues of trust, which I think are probably some of the more difficult ones to deal with going forward as we construct the kind of global system that we need. Thank you all very much. Sobering and very, very informative. Thank you all for a terrific panel. Thank you.